uh, uh, you know, from what we saw across the state, um, it was a nice weekend, and for the most part, you know, you saw some folks out, but in terms of the uh, limiting our uh, individuals, limiting their social gathering, limiting the any large crowds and things of that nature, I think the state did a phenomenal job, a really phenomenal job. And as we always say, uh, the more disciplined we are early on, the more steps we can take to flex open uh, down the line. So uh, great job by the entire state, and I think it gives us a lot of opportunity as we move forward. Um, with that, I am going to kick it over to uh, Commissioner Shimonet for a public health update. Thank you. Today we're announcing 34 new cases of COVID-19 in the state of New Hampshire, bringing our total to 4,231, one new hospitalization, which keeps our total around 10%, and four new deaths, um, all at long-term care facilities. We have 2,551 of our cases recovered, that's 60%, so our current case load is 1,467. Um, Testing, uh, pretty low numbers over uh, Memorial Day weekend, especially Sunday into Monday. A variety of reasons for that, um, including it's a holiday weekend, so I think other people wanted to do other things over the holiday weekend. And I think, you know, we're at the point where supply and demand is pretty equal right now. The people that want testing um, in the categories that we set forth um, have been able to get testing and oftentimes same day testing. So as I had said on Friday, we'll be announcing a new category for, for testing at our fixed test sites. So we're opening up testing for employees who can um, cannot avoid prolonged uh, prolonged close contact with e either uh, peers or members of the general public. So employers that are uh, opening, meeting the universal uh, guidelines that we put forth by uh, DHHS and our public health department uh, are encouraged to contact the department so their employees can be tested either um, this week when they've gone back to work or before they reopen um, and, they, and they want to go back to work. In addition to expanding this, te this testing for employers, the following groups still remain eligible for testing. People with any symptoms at all of COVID-19, anybody that has chronic lung disease or moderate to se severe asthma, serious heart conditions, compromised immunity system, immune systems, obesity, diabetes, chronic kidney disease, liver disease, health care workers, child care workers, people over the age of 60, anybody that lives with anybody um, in any of the above categories. So testly, testing is widely available right now. We are doing same day testing. If you call um, today, you could probably get a test this afternoon. Um, definitely would be able to get you a test tomorrow or any day this week. So people are very much encouraged to, uh, to contact the department to get their test in if they want to. Um, with our new, uh, we have our new test sites up, Keene and Londonderry both opened on Sunday. So uh, total we have nine locations stood up, uh, Claremont, Keene, Concord, Lancaster, Londonderry, Milford, Pl Plymouth, Rochester, Tamworth. In addition to those uh, set sites, we also have what we call go teams at each of those sites, which are mobile teams. So if you are an employer and you have a group of 50, let's say 50 team members or staff, you can either set up a time for them to come to our fixed site or uh, our mobile team may be able to come out and visit you in your parking lot to be able to get it done. There are so many options at this point for testing. No one should want testing and not have it. Um, in addition to those test sites, we also have our eight Clear Choice MD locations, our 11 convenient MD locations, hospital throughout the state, and a variety of primary care physicians. Um, a full list of testing options are, is available on our website uh, under testing guidance. In addition, um, just as a long-term care update, we are announcing three additional outbreaks today. The All American Assisted Living in Londonderry with six residents and 11 staff members. Corville in Manchester, uh, six residents and six staff members. And the Kimmy Nichols Center in Plastow, which serves uh, adults with uh, d disabilities, has three residents and two staff members. 
Um, and that's all I have for an update. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you, Commissioner, very much. A couple things, just a, a few brief items, and then we can open up for questions. Um, I want to let folks know that earlier today I, I signed what uh, executive order number 48 and that's an order uh, to ensure the continued special education services for students that requires that now re will require school di school districts to hold individualized IEP team meetings to consider the extended school year services for every child in the state with an IEP. Uh, at these meetings, IEP teams must now consider whether compensatory education services may be required to provide to be provided due to the circumstances arriving, uh, arising from remote instruction um, and support. This order was crafted with the support of the disability rights organizations, including ABLE New Hampshire, the Disability Rights Center of New Hampshire, uh, parent, the Parent Information Center, and it's all designed to help ensure that students with those individualized education plans uh, continue to receive the support they need. And it goes to the, the understanding that we just know that too many students uh, are still at risk of slipping through the cracks. Uh, and this order will help ensure that school districts and teachers uh, prioritize the needs prioritize the needs of each student on an individualized basis. It's one of the opportunities we can truly provide here in New Hampshire to make sure that we're doing everything we can for these kids one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. Also, uh, as many folks know, uh, more than a week ago, we announced the formation of the Main Street Relief Fund uh, to help small businesses through the economic challenges uh, presented by COVID-19. And uh, again, as a reminder, any business interested in receiving funds from the state must fill out the pre-grant uh, application online at revenue.nh.gov, revenue.nh.gov, and the application period is available uh, through this Friday, May 29th. And again, any small business has until this Friday to fill that application out. To date, we have over 7,700 applications have been received uh, in another three or four days for folks to get those in. Uh, we've always tried to make sure it was a streamlined process. Um, uh, it's not first come first serve or anything like that there but there is a two week period when all those pre-grant applications have to get in and then we'll try to get the checks out uh, as fast as we can um, and finally before we open up for questions a reminder uh, to talk about one more area something we talk often talk about at this time of year given that it's spring uh, we know that as part of the stay at home 2.0 as we call it we want to incentivize folks to you know go out for fresh air go for their home hike challenge uh, we've gotten a lot of success with those programs uh, but as the weather gets warmer it's uh, all important to remember to take time to educate ourselves on Lyme disease uh, it is a another um, a real important issue uh, that we don't want to forget about. Everyone's talking about COVID, but let's not forget about the thousands and tens of thousands of, of people and citizens we have right here in New Hampshire uh, that have Lyme disease. It all starts with a tick bite. And so educating ourselves on the uh, importance of any prevention methods that we can uh, take for ourselves and our families, our pets, whatever it might be, uh, it, it really is all important. Uh, we all know somebody who has been infected uh, by Lyme disease or, or frankly any one of the other bloodborne pathogens uh, that come, uh, I think there's something like 14 that have been now identified in the state of New Hampshire that come from tick bites. Uh, so we did proclaim May Lyme Disease Awareness Month, and we just want to encourage everyone to go to tickfreenh.org. It's a great organization, tickfreenh.org, uh, to just remind folks um, of the pro those preventative me measure measures that they can take so that while they're out and about, while the weather gets warmer, uh, we're all quite aware of um, one of the other real devastating issues that we've had in the state for, for quite a while. So uh, we're all talking COVID, and of course, that's uh, kind of a priority for us right now, but it doesn't mean these other very important issues uh, go by the wayside. So whatever we can do to bring awareness to ourselves, our families, and our communities, I think is a, is a beneficial step. With that, uh, I think we can open up for questions. So you started off by congratulating the state for having a good weekend, essentially, from a social distancing standpoint. There were some examples uh, of violations, particularly up north in Groveton mm -hmm. at the Speedway. Uh, what's the status of what the state's going to do there, and what's your own reaction to seeing somebody essentially saying, no, we're going to do this and we're going to keep sure. it? Sure. So the, the track owner uh, in Groveton that you're referring to was re warned repeatedly um, to uh, not hold an event where there would be a large gathering where social distancing could be challenging. It was definitely against the orders in the state home order uh, that, that we had put into place, and so the Attorney General's Office will be uh, taking further actions later this week. Is 
standard template for response here in terms of escalation, how things work, because we're here in Hampton as well, there might be a hotel or two that's letting rooms to people from out of state. So is it a case-by-case -case basis, or is there a pretty strong I think there's so few and far between, that, and, and we're a small state, and that we can take them out on a case-by-case -case basis. We always want to work with individuals as opposed to saying uh, there's a blanket template here, and you know, you got to come down with a hammer on every single uh, individual. So we have an attorney general's office uh, that led by Gordon McDonald that I think is, is quite exceptional when it comes to customer service and very difficult situations and so uh, letting them do their job and, and work with those individuals as best they can to try to find some type of, of uh, better situation than having to, to bring in court orders and all that kind of stuff um, we always want to be able to, to do that and doing it on a one-on-one -on -one by one-on-one -on -one basis is usually the best way are you worried as the pandemic continues that this could become more widespread essentially no, not really. I, I got to tell you, I mean, I, I was I drove on Hampton Beach on Sunday morning. I drove up just to see, you know, how things were being stationed out and uh, kind of get a, a feel. I mean, I'm over there every once in a while, so getting a feel of things. And I got to tell you, it was it was a nice morning and, and people out walking on the boardwalk, but there weren't folks on the beach. People really were, I think, understanding the responsibility that they have in, in uh, making sure that every every drop in the bucket matters, so to say. You don't want a few apples to spoil the bunch. Um, uh, so, you know, there will be cases. We've always known there will be cases, but as we flex things open, as we can provide more opportunities for folks. Obviously, um, the the need for these types of, of dealing with these types of issues will hopefully go down. They're not going to go away. There are still aspects of our economy that are going to be challenging to fully open without, uh, you know, the, the potential for repercussions. Uh, what I keep calling those super cluster events, where one individual can infect a whole bunch of people in a very short time period and really set uh, not just. Uh, the state, but your community, your town, uh, especially up in a, a place like Groveton. You know, it's a small community. A lot of folks I'm gathering that went to that racetrack were probably from that area. Um, so one super cluster event can affect an area that has a good health care system but doesn't have all the capacity in the world in terms of bed like you might find uh, in other parts of the state or, or whatnot. So, you know, you're putting a lot of folks at risk when you do that. And so we just need everyone to be disciplined. We're going to get through it. We're going to keep flexing things open. But there's going to be continued challenges along the way. And, and anything we can do to work with those individuals one-on-one, -on -one, we're happy to do so. Do you anticipate issuing revised guidelines regarding vacation rentals uh, as people try to make plans for the summer? Yeah, I think later this week, probably in the Friday time frame, we're, we're getting close to finding uh, some, uh, I think, some common ground and, and some way to talk about lodging as a whole. So whether they're vacation rentals, hotels, motels, uh, Airbnb, uh, we'll have an announcement on Friday to, I think, give folks a little better sense of, of where we go with all of that. I've got a testing question, maybe, Commissioner. Sure. Thanks. Basically, I was looking for clarity on uh, changing categories in the COVID and uh, in the COVID testing mm -hmm. briefings. And about a couple of weeks ago, uh, new testing categories were issued: yep. uh, total PCR tests and total antibody tests. At that same time, the state stopped reporting out, quote, persons tested negative in selected laboratories. Um, can you explain the significance of that? So what we're reporting out is total persons, persons tested at selected la laboratories, which is the same as the negative number, which is 64,232. And then when you add that into our positive counts, which is 4,200, your rate at about 6,900. Um, for for the statewide so the reason why we keep expanding categories is because we if we open up testing completely in one shot we there's no way we can handle a quarter million people trying to drive to nine testing sites in three days so we're taking the highest risk populations first and then we're we're moving out from the highest risk population to the next risk and then you know who's at risk of spreading it in the community and that's really you know when we look at people that are going back to work that for one reason or the other, think hairdressers, right? They're not able to socially distance for, for six feet why they're doing their work to have them tested if they want to be tested. That's why we're expanding the categories. We're testing it. We're reporting out um, the same data, if not more data on testing than we ever have been um, currently. Have we ever blended numbers on, on testing people who tested negative for antibody tests? Like that's been an issue in some states in terms so, of... So Yep. So the first the first two days that we were doing it, we um, asterisked our numbers and said this is a combination, and we will report out them separately tomorrow. We just didn't have the right um, 
report in our system to be able to divide them out that was a day or two but um, since since we really started uh, working with Clear Choice MD is when we started reporting out antibody numbers because the prior to that the number was so negligible it, it, it wouldn't have changed it either way. So you'll see each day this report that comes out that clearly separates PCR and antibody. Just to be clear, um, when it comes to capacity for testing, is that still a function of how many tests there are available no. to the state? No. What are the, what are the limiting factors at this point? Is it how many um, the limiting factors sites there are and, and nope. the, one, the, the, lim one. the limiting factor at this point are, are the people the number of people in any distinct group that wants to get a test right if I if we just open up and said anybody in New Hampshire 1.3 million people can get a test regardless of uh, their risk factors or symptomology um, if even half of those people decided to get testing that would be there, our, our, our testing capacity would be limited just by the sheer number of people. But right now we get... That, that is my question. So it is a, it's a function of how many tests there are or how many sites there are? No, it's, it's, it's just a function of being able to test that many people in a, in a couple day window, which is why we've spread it out over, you know, a couple of weeks. I guess another way to put it, is there, with spreading, with, um, if you were spread it out like you're talking about, is, are there enough tests for everybody eventually to get a test. Um, well, so swabs, which has always been the big limiting factor, we received an order of 2 million swabs in this weekend, so obviously not a factor. Um, test kits come in regularly on a, on a weekly basis. PPE, we, we have plenty of PPE with the exception of N95s. We're still struggling with those. We have a small, a small cache of those. But for the most part, it's not, it's not about having enough individual test supplies to do the testing on our residents. It's about not being able to test a million residents in one week. So spreading it out and prioritizing high-risk people makes the most sense for the state. Um, the percentage positive. Yes. Um, I don't have that update with me right now. I can tell you that it's been running between two and three, three and a half percent, as has our PCR test um, right around. It, it varies between two and four. And I know we've been asked this a lot. Is that an indication that the virus is not really um, spread among, around the state? Is it been some narratives suggesting that a lot of people got it and didn't know it, and there's been other narratives suggesting the virus is moving and got here. Um, I, I think that we've said right from the very beginning that we have widespread community transmission in New Hampshire, and um, we we continue to say that that is our messaging for the state of New Hampshire and for the citizens is that there is widespread community transmission, um, which means that there are um, both symptomatic and asymptomatic people. And we have seen um, ongoing evidence of non-symptomatic people in um, in our communities, in healthcare provider, at healthcare uh, facilities, specifically in our nursing home testing, we've seen evidence of that over and over again. So I think it's fair to say that there is widespread community transmission, although our percent pot positive is fairly low, which is good. I guess just to tie this up, this is the kind of ultimate question I'm going for is that when will we have the data we need to know whether the virus is starting to run its course? Because if the antibody tests are still a very low percentage, I would suggest that uh, the people who are choosing to take antibody tests, not many are, are showing us how to have the virus. So when is the state going to be able to know when the virus is actually? You know, I, I think what what we're what we're watching right now. I, I don't know the answer to like the ultimate endpoint that you're asking about. I don't think anybody knows the answer to that question. Uh, what we're what we're watching right now is that as we take these small steps in reopening, is what is the impact on those numbers? So are we going to start seeing our percent positive go up? Are we going to start seeing our hospitalizations or our case numbers overall go up? That's what we're really watching right now. We're about two weeks from our first small step we took. Um, you know, typically we would wait two to three weeks to see what if that had an outcome on our test, uh, on our positivity rate. Um, so right now we're in that window where we're watching very closely. But the positive test percentage does seem to be still inching down. We're right around 6.5% of all tests, it looks like, of all cases. Um, when, when would it be safe to say we're out of the woods 
I mean, in other words, um, if this positive percent positive rate keeps going down for the next month, mm -hmm. that's a really good sign. Isn't I it? think it's a combination of factors that we're looking at. It, it's got to be it, there's so many da data points that we look at to determine when is the right time to start opening up, right? So. Um, we all know at this point that COVID-19 has hit our nursing homes harder than any other area of our state. And as long as we continue to have outbreaks and significant negative outcomes at nursing homes, I'm not ready to say any of that. Um, our, our nursing home residents don't have, doesn't have the liberty of socially distancing away from their caregivers. They rely on their caregivers for their activities of daily living and to have their care done every day. Those caregivers are part of our communities. So as long as there's still COVID circulating in our communities, there is always a risk of bringing it into their nursing home and there is always a risk of negative out outcomes. Uh, Governor, last week President Trump ordered all states to reopen churches uh, and also threatened to override uh, states that refused to do so. How do you plan to respond? Do you plan to override that guidance? And what is the state's guidance to houses of worship right now? Sure. So uh, following that uh, statement by the president, uh, they said that the CDC would be releasing guidelines uh, around places of worship, which they did. We got it uh, late Friday afternoon. So we've taken a look at that over the weekend. And uh, we'll probably have a, a we're kind of finalizing what we think we can do, uh, what other states have done, what has worked, what hasn't worked. And we'll have, probably have an announcement on that later this week. Why do you think mask wearing has become so political? And as governor, I don't know. As governor, do you yeah. feel you need to lead and step in and take a more firm position to kind of settle that debate for people here in New Hampshire? No, I, you know, the question being why has mask wearing become so political? I mean, you want my philo philosophical? Because we all need something to argue about lately. You know, it's one of the sad natures. I mean, and mask wearing is a simple thing to argue about. We can argue about that stranger. Why isn't he wearing a mask? Why aren't you wearing a mask? I don't know why it's so political. I think it's silly. It's not about who's doing it and why. It's about does it, it, does it make folks healthier? Um, we encourage folks to wear them, absolutely. Um, is it absolutely required by CDC guidelines or anything like that? No, it's not, and it's not absolutely required here. But I think a lot of people, um, given that we don't require it, given that you know it's very different than anything we were doing two or three months ago, and given that most people are wearing them, I think it's a, it's a very positive sign here. So. You know, why, why is it political? Everyone wants to argue about something lately. I don't know. Too much social media. So you don't think it would help if you said, okay, mass order or, I mean, I guess for you to step in, what would it mm -hmm. take? Well, I, I, well, I, I think, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if it's about me stepping in or not, and I'm in. <laughs> I mean, this is it. I've st I stepped in in March. Um, and, and we've been very clear and very consistent with our message. We recommend it. Uh, we, we think it, it, it should be done, but in some circumstances, like if you're out grocery shopping or just in the public, it's not required. In, in circumstances where people are, again, with, in retail, if you're working in a retail uh, front fit customer facing situation, you're, in, you're working in a restaurant, of course, yeah, we're going to mandate it in, certain, in those certain areas where we know there can be a lot of di very direct close contact uh, interaction or, you know, over a period of time. Uh, and we want to be sure we're protecting those customers. But um, just walking around down the street or walking on the, you know, down the sidewalk or something or going for a hike, you know, there, there's no, you know, we're not at the point where we, you, we have to mandate the, the mask wearing. I know Massachusetts did it, but, you know, we don't have to here. We don't have that rate of transmission right now. You mentioned on the business side, if a business is reopened under guidance that asks or that requires them to mask their employees and they're not doing that, What's the appropriate reaction of a consumer? Should they be calling someone? Should they just turn around and walk away? What should they do? Um, yeah, I, I would no. We're not look. We're not asking consumers to you know pick up the phone and you know we don't have snitch lines and all that. I don't believe in all that. If if there are businesses that are kind of thwarting the guidance, we usually hear about it one way or the other. I'll say that, and uh, and we respond to it appropriately. And again, usually we can just work with a, a business if they're not available. Maybe there's a certain circumstance why they can't. Maybe there's a, an underlying health issue for some of those workers, and if those workers can be put in a different uh, aspect of their, their job that don't, don't put them in a position where they have to wear the mask or all, we're always willing to, to work with individuals. But. You wrote to the president uh, last week, asked about the National Guard asking President to extend the deployment, special deployment period under uh, Title 32 that allows the um, National Guardsmen to be reimbursed federally. Uh, have you heard anything back to the White House on that? And, um, 
Yeah. No, not yet. Um, I, I do believe some folks from the National Guard will be joining us here in the state uh, later this week. So we'll have the opportunity to kind of push the case a little bit. But it really is an order for from the president. Uh, and, uh, and we hope to get it. I know I was on a phone call with the vice president and uh, a bunch of the other governors earlier today. And some of the other governors were talking about it. I think Governor Murphy had brought it up directly with the vice president, the need to extend that order, uh, hopefully. So we do have it through the uh, mid-June, I think about June 24th, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and again, the 500 or so men and women of the National Guard just continue to knock it out of the park here for New Hampshire. Um, you know, we're not asking to extend that order for nothing. We're asking to extend the order because those are the men and women that are helping at the food bank, that are manning our call centers, that are doing so many different things, our testing centers. I mean, they're the ones on the front lines of a lot of these issues. Um, they do whatever they're asked. It's just unbelievable what they're willing to step up and do. And so having a resource like that is very valuable, So, that, which is why we, we hope they'll extend it felt well beyond June. Look, what would be the implication if, if, it, if it weren't extended for this service would, that you yeah. described? If uh, the Title 32 uh, request was not extended beyond June, uh, we'd just have to make some different accommodations. We'd probably have to scale back what, uh, how we were using our National Guard. Doesn't mean we'd get rid of it altogether, but now there's just more cost implications to the state level, and we could we have some funds that could that could support that to be sure. But we'd probably have to scale back in terms of what we do, the timing of what we do. The Title 32 order gives us a lot of flexibility in terms of what we can use these individuals for, and that's just been an, an awesome resource. And I think I speak for all 50 governors uh, when I say that. So. Um, um, it doesn't mean it would go away entirely, but we'd probably have to scale back and prioritize. Uh, I was told today, actually, by the National Guard that about 700 uh, guardsmen uh, are deployed right now around the state and doing uh, a number of things. I, I just wonder, compared to the other uh, aspects of the state's response, what proportion is made up right now of, of National Guardsmen? How might that be affected if this is not extended? Sure. So uh, what proportion of the National Guardsmen are making up the state's response? So I'm going to answer that in two ways. First. Uh, we have a, about 300 men and women in our 3,000 men and women in our National Guard. So you're looking at nearly 25% of them being deployed. If the number is already up to 700, I, the general probably deployed a, a few more over the past few days, which is great, uh, being able to do that. So you're looking at 20, 25% of our of our National Guard are deployed at, at any given time, which is just an awesome resource in terms of the entire all the resources necessary at the state level. Um, uh, you know, it's that's literally thousands of individuals because we're using them not just for state services, we're using them at the food bank, we're using them in private testing facilities, we're using them wherever folks need uh, a helping hand on the front lines, they're, they're there and, and we're happy to provide that. So that's one of the awesome parts of their flexibility is that it's not just in they're, they're being used in state offices for only state services. It's all over the state, and that's, that's you know thousands and thousands of individuals. Now, um, it's not the end-all, be-all if, if we can't use them be all beyond June, but it would definitely limit our capacity to uh, respond in the way that you know we want to – with the flexibility we think we need to respond and stay right on top of some of these issues. Can you confirm whether or not the liquor store employee and on the Hanover Street store in Manchester is the only liquor commission employee to test positive? Is, is, uh, I don't know. To be honest, I, I apologize. Uh, it's if it isn't, it's one of only a couple. But I, I don't know of any off the top uh, others off the top of my head. So we can find out for you though, to be sure. Our employees oh. with New Hampshire Hospital are they getting the uh, three hundred dollars per week? Right now, no. Mm -hmm. Is there? Um, there would, there's been some discussion about it, to be sure, yeah. and it's something that that we can definitely look at. But Why do you think most states haven't done this? You, know, you because they've waited. I mean, Congress is. The president talked about it in mid-March. Um, there have been two mm -hmm. stimulus bills since. Um, Why have other states not bills. done the stipend like we did? Yeah. Um, I don't know. I don't want to speak for other governors. It could just be, uh, you know, every state is so different. Yeah. You know, uh, let me give you a quick example, and, and I apologize. I don't know the numbers exactly, but I was talking to Governor Baker. Massachusetts has about five times our population. They have. Uh, depending on how you look at it, 10 times or more the, the level of COVID that we have in our state at any given time. So they're dealing with an unprecedented issue down there. But in terms of the flex, Flexible Cares Act funds, I want to say they received about twice as much as we did, something like that, because of the formula. They didn't receive five times as much. So certain states, just on a per capita basis, are a little more limited in terms. Other states, I think, probably have more opportunity than we do. Every state got at least one and a quarter billion. So if you looked at a state like Wyoming with about, or even Vermont with about half our population, uh, per capita they got about twice as much as we did, right? So my point is every state is a little bit different in terms of how much they might have received on, on a per capita basis. Um, every state is, is very different in terms of the level of COVID that they have to deal with. In Massachusetts, uh, I don't want to speak for Governor Baker, but my sense is a lot of his funds 
uh, are being deployed to and should be deployed to healthcare, right? On the front lines of healthcare facilities, long-term care facilities. Um, you know, that's just where they, their, their need is right now. I'm sure they would love to do some of the economic relief or some of the stipend relief that we're doing, uh, but not every state is going to have that opportunity, unfortunately. And I think it just, again, goes to how different every state is. Uh, everyone's dealing with it. I think every governor's, you know, doing a, a great job. And more importantly, why the governors are the ones that really need to have the flexibility to design the systems for the best results for their COVID issue, their constituency, their economic um, uh, you know, downturn, and everyone's going to face some economic downturn. Um, and the economic downturn looks very different, too. You know, I was talking to Governor uh, Doug, um, Governor Doug, Doug, Governor Burgum of North Dakota, um, uh, and the governor of Alaska as well, governor of Wyoming. Those states really rely on oil, right, and energy. Well, oil is really down. So it isn't a matter of, of businesses being closed, but just the, 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 uh, the indirect issues that the market is driving in some of those other states that are driving other uh, economic issues for not just their citizens, but for their state revenues as well. So it's just, again, just an example of how every state is very different and, and why governors really do need the flexibility uh, to, to move and move quickly. The negotiations, bipartisan negotiations in the state house appear to be breaking down this week. Uh, the House of Republicans voted in a caucus today. Uh, they announced that they have, they say they have serious concerns with the process ahead of the um, session that's being planned in Durham next month, and that they may not agree to the rule changes, which may mean that there are dozens, hundreds of bills that may not be able to be passed and may be dead in the water if rules changes don't happen. How time, how tapped into this are you and um, have you been talking to parties? Sure. Uh, when it comes to the, the bipartisan negotiations between how the House and the Senate are going to conduct their legislative business, given that they have to be in different locations, um, that's really their business and their rules. Um, I can say wherever the House meets or wherever the Senate meets, they make their own rules, and they have to, and the, the members do have to abide by them. But obviously, leadership has to come to con some consensus, and w I'm really not involved in those discussions at all. You know. Priorities, though, as governor in the bills that exist now or in any amendments that you would like to add um, that relate to this crisis mm -hmm. and that, would, that you would want to see passed? And, and what would I really like to see passed when they get back together? I, I, just off the top of my head, and, and this is, uh, you know, one of the issues that I've been fighting for for a few years that I've been thwarted by the Democrats uh, on is student debt relief, right? We had a $16 million student debt relief plan that would have cost taxpayers nothing. They, they shot it out. They took it out of the budget. Okay, that was part of the negotiations, what we had to give, fine. But we there was a promise that they would come back and really fight hard to get student debt relief. We hear there might may be a bill, they're looking at rule changes that would do more scholarships, not student debt relief. And scholarships are great too, don't get me wrong. But given that, um, you know, whether it's it's a little different, but it's, it's on the same track of uh, rental or, or housing relief or utility relief, right? These are bills that are going to come every month for these students. Anything we do to help incentivize them to stay and work here and help pay down some of that, uh, that debt while uh, hopefully incentivizing them to, to be at work and, and be part of our, our growing economic structure um, without ca having those, them carry the burdens through tough economic times. I mean, we're doing that for a lot of other areas. Um, you know, I still think we need to go full throttle on student debt relief, and I, I hope the Democrats have a change of heart and join us in doing that, but, you know, we'll see. We have a few calls. The next question comes from Holly Raymer with the Associated Press. Holly, please go ahead with your question. Hi. Um, can you clarify, uh, this is a testing question, um, in which scenario can a household member get tested? Is it only if they live with someone who's older or has a health condition, or is it any household member of any of those other categories, like a household member of someone with mild symptoms, or a household member of a child care worker? Um, it's a household member of any any of the conditions, including um, household member of people with any symptoms of COVID or any of the conditions that I listed, chronic lung disease, serious heart con conditions, immune system issues, obesity, um, diabetes, chronic uh, kidney disease, liver disease. Um, as a, or anybody over the age of 60, obviously, you know, the target population um, for this cr uh, category is, is really the caregivers and the household members of people that are at high risk 
um, people that care for the elderly, people that have elderly parents that live in their home, people that have uh, household members that have disabilities uh, and uh, or children with disabilities. So that is really the group that we're targeting here. Thank you. Paul Hayes with the Caledonian Record. Please go ahead, Paul. Hi, Governor. Uh, just uh, wanted to follow up on Riverside. Uh, I was hoping you could talk about how that fits to the big picture up here in the North Country, where people are very concerned about the future of small businesses. Uh, I know Riverside, uh, the owner said, attractive risk doesn't open. But people up here are also very concerned about gathering and the impact of uh, you know, tourists from hard hit areas on the public health system. So you discuss sort of how it fits in the picture of those issues. I'm sorry, could you just repeat the question? I want to make sure I'm getting at the heart. Are you saying just to talk generally about the issues of small business in the North Country? Am I getting that right? Well, Riverside is a business where the owner said that if the risk is closed, they don't open the season. They just purchased it last fall. And they're concerned about the impact of that on business. Uh, in the bigger picture, people are worried that the business is going to close and the fragile North Country economy could really be hard hit. At the same time, people are worried about the uh, impact of health, uh, the healthcare system, of the tourists and other gatherings. So there's a push and pull here, and we're just asking to be right to it. Sure, sure. So the question is really about small business, the impact of small business, and, and really, if I may, the balancing that, that um, um, we're asking a lot of folks to, to undertake given the tough economic times. I'll say this, the issue does not simply revolve around one racetrack in, 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 in the North Country. Um, uh, that's a, uh, frankly just a very uh, a limited way of looking at, at that. Every small business in the state is likely at risk economically of closing their doors. Everyone is making sacrifices. Everybody. Whether you're a small hotel owner, whether you're a small racetrack, whether you're a small restaurant, um, all those businesses are at, at very severe risk, which is exactly why I, I designed the, the Main Street Relief Fund, to focus on small businesses, get them cash relief easy, quickly, uh, and without uh, you know the bureaucracy. And we're trying to do it as fast as, as, as possible. Um, we understand that uh, April and May have been very, very tough months for these businesses, extremely tough months. Um, you know, there are some, I was talking to a business owner early, earlier today that was down 80% in, in both months. They're barely scraping by. They're, they're, they're surviving, but literally barely scraping by, and obviously a few more months of that isn't going to um, uh, you know, last, last too long. So uh, it really is a balance. We're asking everyone to make sacrifice. All the more reason why one business can't say, well, I, 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 you know, if I don't pay my bills, I'm going bankrupt, so I'm just going to ignore the guidance. You, you can't do that. You really cannot because it puts so many, it put, you're putting individuals' personal health at risk. You're putting a lot of things at risk. Um, there are sacrifices happening, not just a couple dozen or a couple hundred, but thousands of businesses across the state. Um, are at risk of shutting their doors if they haven't already. We are very, very aware of that and cognizant of it, which is why we're trying to move as quickly as possible. But let's also remember that we still have a lot of COVID cases in the state. We have nearly uh, 2,000, just shy of 2,000 active COVID cases in the state, maybe in the 1,500 range. That's a lot, and it's, and it's at all levels in the state. So um, it's a very tough ask of individuals, I know. Um, uh, again, my, my former business was you know, hotels, restaurants, and tourism in the North Country. I get it. I absolutely get it. Um, every one of those businesses is, is at risk, not just mine, but all across, all across the state. And, and so, believe me, it, it, it hits hard. And it's what's kept me up uh, in, in many sleepless nights over the past couple months. Um, we are flexing things open. We're finally at the point of moving forward. If you told me a month ago I was going to be thinking about flexing open the beaches on June 1st, I would have said, no way. It's not possible. But you know what? We found a way. The numbers got better. We're on a good track. We're seeing what other states are doing. We're looking at other models. We're working hard. Um, it's an all-hands-on-deck effort, and we're, we're actually able to do things that I didn't even think was possible a few months ago. We're getting testing levels to, to levels where um, I didn't think were going to be possible. Those are all incredibly powerful tools. All the more reason we just need folks to have some more patience, to hold on. We know it's asking a lot, um, but we are all in this, this together, and there is a, a collective need, I think, to, um, to appreciate those sacrifices, but understand that they have to be made. And in very short order, hopefully sooner than we think, we can be back on the right track economically. Excuse the pun. But. The next question comes from Donna Jordan with the Colbert Chronicle. Please go ahead. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you for your time today. 
I have a couple of really quick questions. I think Commissioner Shivanet, they may be for you. Uh, the first one is that Johns Hopkins University has really awesome COVID-19 maps showing cases all over the world. Uh, you tend to get right down to county level per state. They show COAS as having 13 cases, whereas the state of New Hampshire shows four cases. Um, though I suspect we might be seeing those numbers increase in the coming days. Um, can you explain to me why there's a difference in those two numbers? It must be the way they do their mapping. The second real quick question is, I'm wondering if with all of these outbreaks at long-term care facilities, is there going to be a new standard, do you think, um, of what employees might need to do upon entering the facility before taking care of long-term care patients? I know they're very careful now as it is. Is there more that can be done for this or any other buses? Thank you. Yes, no problem. Um, so I'm not sure what the discrepancy in the Coas County numbers are. I can assure you that our our numbers are accurate uh, that are coming out of public health. I think that there are times where uh, there are certain border communities and there there have been times that we've had to adjust our numbers because uh, they get tested in lo one location and then we find out that they live right over the border in a different county. Um, so. Um, our, ours are accurate. I'm not sure what the discrepancy is. There is always issues around um, people, especially uh, around the, on the Vermont border that live in New Hampshire and work in Vermont or vice versa. And some of the larger um, report outs may have some inaccuracies there. We, through our public health investigation, we really dr drill down into that information um, to make sure we report out accurate numbers. So your, your question about long-term care facilities, um, we're, we're doing active screening right now. Uh, and what, what you're going to see coming is, and what we're doing is testing all the employees. And, and even the federal government has recommended serial testing for the employees. And we're in the middle of negotiating a contract to be able to do that on a every to seven to 10 day basis. Um, I think that's going to be the new standard. Having a COVID test prior to showing up for a new job is going to be the standard um, for the foreseeable future um, in, in, the, in the coming months. So, while you're there, how many outbreaks or clusters are there currently considered active by your department at long-term care facilities? At long-term care facilities? So usually I have a list, if you just bear with me for a minute. We have 17 um, long-term care facilities. We have some others that are um, that are not long-term care facilities, but are considered outbreaks, like one of the ones I announced today. But um, I just want to put a note in there: we have probably four or five that are ready to drop off that list tomorrow. So as long as they get new cases, don't get new cases today, that tomorrow their um, outbreak is going to be clear. Are those the same? facilities you've referenced facilities in the past that were about to that were we, we've had we've had several drop off through through the the time and you know oftentimes what happens even with facilities that we that have a case or two case or three case there's such a period of time between cases like they'll have a positive and then they'll have another positive two weeks from now and then they'll have another positive two weeks from then and it's hard to say that's really an outbreak because uh, it doesn't fit you know with with the standards but uh, yeah I think what you'll see is that the facilities that came on early on have dropped off there's several more facilities getting ready to drop off and what we're hoping is that as new facilities come on with our new testing guidelines we are able to catch it quicker and contain it sooner the next question comes from Paula Tracy with in-depth Paula please go ahead Good afternoon, Governor and everyone there. Um, I'm sorry about the sound of motorcycles going by my house. It's kind of uh, noisy out here. But um, I have two questions, one um, about the upcoming election, and the other is to clarify um, the workers um, will be able to get testing from face-to-face -face who have face-to-face -face contact. Is that going to be um, available next week? 
week, um, and uh, I'm not sure I heard that correctly. It's available now. And I have a, it's available now. It so, is, yeah. Uh, that's good. Okay, and then I had a question. Um, tomorrow, Secretary Gardner and um, Brad Cook will be participating in one of um, 50 um, cyber uh, security election um, uh, virtual panel discussions that are being held across the state and the nation. And um, I was interested in knowing, I guess, um, we have some money that has come in for um, the upcoming election um, and would allow us to perhaps expand some of the um, opportunities to vote from home because of COVID-19. But I also wondered whether um, the cybersecurity was also um, in line to get some funding for that. So uh, the question is really revolves around the funding and how it relates to cybersecurity, which is there will be a national panel discussion that um, both Secretary Gardner and some other folks will be participating in uh, tomorrow. You know, one of the uh, I'll start with this. One of the issues we take great pride in in New Hampshire is, is we do have uh, we always have cybersecurity issues in everything you do nowadays, of course, um, but not to the level of others that other states do. Um, all of our optical scanners here in New Hampshire, uh, they are they're wireless and their um, internet connectivity is disabled uh, before they go in so there's that we already have created these natural barriers and hats off to Secretary Gardner uh, for having the forethought on a lot of this uh, ahead of time um, but <clears throat> they'll participate in the panel and of course there's, there's always other means where we're, we're, we can look to make sure that our system is secure and viable and in all the different aspects around voting or, or what might happen in, in our local communities around voting um, there are funds available. Uh, there's at least an initial uh, funds uh, funding stream of about $3.2 million that came in. And um, as we said, we're not changing our voting uh, our process really at all other than to say that um, if for folks want to vote absentee, which they can do right now, uh, because of the the COVID the issue of COVID, uh, they can do so. And they can check that box and do so. That's It's really that simple. We already have a very robust absentee ballot voting process uh, and so we're just allowing that 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 little bit of flexibility for this election the next question is from Michael Graham of New Hampshire Journal please go ahead thank you so governor there's a lot of talk about the fiscal impact on the state's budget from the shutdown as much as you get ready to gather together and I'm curious what your working number is for the size of the hole that the budget will be facing that can't be filled by federal money. Also, as you know, some Democrats are talking about uh, this being the moment when a new look at the tax code should be taken, a broad-based tax to fill that hole. Do you agree that this is the time for something like a statewide sales or income tax, as some of your Democratic friends have suggested? Uh, so, uh, in terms of the amount of, uh, of a hole, if you will, the revenue hole that the state will be looking at, um, it's somewhere in the neighborhood of five to seven hundred million dollars. That's what we're currently estimating, but it's, it's please understand, that's a bit unknown. Uh, it could be more, it could be less. We're really not 100% sure, but uh, we have folks that are constantly updating those numbers and looking at it, so uh, there'll be about 150 million dollars uh, in uh, through June 30th of this year, and then potentially another 350, 450 million dollars uh, in revenue losses next year. Could, could be more. Uh, we're not quite sure. We don't know how those revenue holes will be filled out of the federal government that we, because the next stimulus package will likely have that the Congress will pass, and I think something will get passed. We'll likely have some funds in there to allow states to uh, backfill some of those revenues. Uh, we don't know which, 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 what kind of flexibility we'll have, or how much money might come in, or or what the pushes and pulls there will be. So it would be I think premature to make any firm decisions on anything knowing that there's a, a giant opportunity out there then we just don't know what exactly what it's going to look like in terms of the the, the tax code absolutely not we should not be passing broad-based taxes I know the Democrats tried to pass their income tax last time there was broad-based support uh, in, in by the Democrats in the House in the Senate um, and you know as much as they want to keep pushing those ideas we're going to veto them um, and, and hold and hold those vetoes because that is not what New Hampshire does and to think that uh, anyone actually even entertaining broad-based taxes right now, um, when, when the chips are down, when times are tough, when families don't have enough mo as, as much money as they might have had, when jobs are, are, are hard to come by, the last thing you should be doing is taxing the people of the state more. That's absolutely the wrong, the wrong path to go by. You can always manage through. It might make, mean 
Uh, leadership has to make some very tough decisions. It might mean that programs get delayed or capital projects might get delayed. But again, we don't even know if that's going to happen, given that uh, we will likely get some stimulus out of the federal government. But even if no stimulus came, and that's probably not going to be the case, but even if none of it came, you can always manage. You can always prioritize. I've always said there are some sacred cows, if you will. There are certain programs that I simply will not uh, cut anything out of. If, an, if anything, there are certain programs that I think we need to enhance, whether you're talking about programs around children, ab abused kids, uh, special education services, um, uh, domestic violence. These are the things, uh, SUD, uh, out, you know, uh, issues around addiction. These are the issues that tend to really um, uh, explode during tough economic times, and, and now is not the right time to pull back on those things. You've got to really make sure you're, you're moving forward with them. Now, that might mean we might have to make tougher decisions decisions in other areas, we can do it. We can manage. And, and I'm happy to make those, those tough decisions. I'm not happy about it, I guess, but I know that that's, that comes with the job. That's the responsibility of the job. When, when times get tough and you have to make tough decisions on how to spend money, you don't defer and just go take more out of the, the pockets of, of your citizens. Um, anybody can do that. I mean, that's, that's not management. That's not innovation. So um, the idea that we're even talking about these broad-based sales tax and income taxes out of, out, of, out of, you know, the Democrats right now, it gets me a little concerned. It should get everyone a little bit concerned. But I feel confident that uh, we can show a path forward. We can show a way to, to manage through it. We can show a budget that makes sense without bringing those taxes to bear and, uh, and hopefully show it to the people of the state as well and, and, and work through and get it done. Tony Chanella of The Patch. Tony, please go ahead. Uh, thank you very much. Um, two follow-up questions, please, for Commissioner Chabonet. First, we've been working with the assumption that all or nearly all of the deaths associated with COVID here in New Hampshire have been people with underlying and chronic health conditions. Is this still accurate or has that changed? And then second, previously, I believe it was Way in the early part of April, I asked about a number of residents who have reported to me that they have had they had severe flu in December, January, and February. The severe flu passed, and now they're wondering if they had coronavirus in all of that time and just didn't know it. We had been doing a lot of testing. You know, you started with the, the travelers back in late January. Um, with the introduction of the antibody testing, and granted, understanding that everybody's so focused on current contact tracing and investigations. Is the department going to circle back with those people or expand categories for the antibody testing for those people who may have had that severe flu at the time? Thank you. Okay. Uh, I'll, 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 well, I'm, I'm happy to take it. Are you sure? Okay. I'll, I, like I said, I'll answer it, and then the, the commissioner can come up and correct me, I suppose. Uh, the vast majority of cases uh, have had underlying health, health conditions. That uh, was true a few weeks ago, and that, that remains true today. Uh, in terms of the antibody test, anyone can contact Clear Choice and get an antibody test. So if folks did have symptoms uh, back in February, if they, they suspected they had COVID when we had very limited testing capability, um, we definitely encourage them to reach out to Clear Choice and, uh, and get that antibody test. Again, there's no financial barrier if they don't have insurance or... Uh, um, uh, they, you know, they have other financial barriers to, to themselves. It doesn't matter. We will take care of it um, on our end. But uh, anybody interested in getting an antibody test can absolutely go out and get an antibody test. And, and again, all those results get uh, fed up to the, to the state. So. Okay. All right, good. Okay, great. Well, look, thanks everyone for joining us. We'll have more updates. Uh, it is going to be very warm this week. We understand that. So we want people to stay cool. Um, you know, and, and again, uh, I'm just very happy to see that as we kind of progress through this, as summer really starts to hit us, um, you know, the beaches will, will eventually get open and, and next week. And we'll be watching for those who were, some folks were asking me a little bit earlier, we'll be watching to see what happens in some of the other states, whether it's in, in Massachusetts or Maine or some of the other uh, states where some of their seashore beaches have open. We'll see how they manage traffic, how they manage crowd control and obviously help help us make some of the decisions to, to refine our model refine our guidance if, if necessary and make sure that it's a success for everybody it's something that we can we can open we can flex open and we can do it in a way that is sustainable for the entire state so stay cool we'll, we'll see you guys later <laughs>